The next session will be Thailand Innovative Business, Readiness of Thailand's Ecosystem and Infrastructure for New Economies and Businesses. If you have any questions for this session, you may submit to us by scanning the QR code shown on screen. Our panelists for this session are Mr. Paul C. Warakun, Group CEO of A-Commerce Mr. Dan Batomwanit, CEO of NR Instant Produce Mr. David Cho, Co-Founder and CEO of Pomelo Fashion Mr. Saran Sutantit Warakun, Director of Yggdrasil Group and our moderator, Dr. Napat Chatusi Pitak, founder and CEO of Siam Metrics Consultant. Mr. Paul C. Warakun is one of the founders and group CEO of A-Commerce, a full-service end-to-end e-commerce solutions provider in Southeast Asia that has raised over 17 million US dollars since its founding in May 2013. He is also the co-founder and executive chairman of Arden Capital, an early-stage internet private capital fund focused on Southeast Asia. Mr. Dan Patomondit is a sustainability and plant-based activist who is in love with the food industry. He started his journey as a financial advisor with Hatton Capital. He also co-founded Hatton Equity Partners Thailand with over $40 million in asset under management. He became the director of several food companies and the CEO of NR Instant Produce Public Company Limited or NRF. His purpose is to transform the food system for a more inclusive and sustainable world. That is why he has launched several sustainability initiatives within his companies in order to pave the way to green business. Mr. David Joe is the CEO and co-founder of Pomelo, a leading digital fashion platform in Asia. David previously co-founded Lazada, where he served as managing director. During his tenure, Lazada Thailand grew to be one of the leading online shopping sites in Thailand. Prior to Lazada, David was at Bain & Company in New York and New Mountain Capital, a $10 billion private equity fund based in New York. Mr. Saran Sutanti Warakun is the director of Idrazu Group PCL, one of the top VFX animation and VR studios in Bangkok, specializing in full post-production services for commercials, feature films, games, cinematics, TV series, and VR 360. Welcome everyone. Today, good afternoon everyone. Welcome back to Thailand Focus 2021. My name is Napat and I'm super excited to moderate this session on Thailand Innovative Business. As I'm a tech entrepreneur myself, I'm also looking forward to the many interesting insights, stories, lessons from the conversations we're about to have. Thailand may not be the most well known when it comes to innovation, but that doesn't mean that we don't have it, right? Today, I'm joined by four highly accomplished leaders who will tackle three main questions together in the four to five minutes session. One, how do you grow an innovative business successfully in Thailand? Two, what's the role of ecosystem that supports this kind of innovative activity? And three, the role of capital markets. What's the thought process when it comes to accessing the capital markets in Thailand? Before we start, right, we would uh, we want to uh, sort of kick things off by doing a one minute pitch. Uh, it's sort of like a, a game where uh, everyone in this room, we have to do it all over again. Uh, so a one minute pitch will begin um, with Kun Dan Kap. Kun Dan Kap. Do you have our slides? All right, so um, uh, th thank you. So our company NRF, we listed last year. Um, our purpose is really um, around how we can decarbonize the world um, through food um, transformation or with food, because food represents one third of uh, global climate emissions. This is the challenge of humanity, challenge of our time as indicated by the IPCC report released two weeks ago. And it's one of the greatest opportunities in the world. And food is ground zero. And what we are, we're a fully integrated global food um, company. 
focused uh, on our uh, supply chain, our value chain, which is SDG driven, um, starting off with our upstream, which are carbon reducing ingredients, moving all the way towards our global strategy of building global production manufacturer uh, facilities around the world to produce carbon negative or carbon neutral foods, such as plant-based foods. And we believe alternative proteins is gonna drive this transition um, for the future. And we believe that with our strategy, we're gonna become one of the biggest alternative protein producers um, in the world. Thank you so much, uh, Kundan. Um, I think that that's a really cool introduction to our session. Uh, now let's move on to um, Kun Paul. Kun Paul, uh, could you please uh, give us a one minute quick overview of your business, uh, Nakap? Team Cup, uh, could you please bring up the slides for Kun Paul? Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, e-commerce, we are an e-commerce enablement platform and solutions provider across um, Southeast Asia. Really, um, you know, the problems we're solving is the complexity in e-commerce localization in across Southeast Asia and different countries, the fragmentation, act data and control, um, and really the time and investment it takes for a lot of the brands to, to, to launch end-to-end -end e e-commerce. So what we do is we provide, an, uh, we're an enterprise partner for the brands, managing their e-commerce journey across, you know, all these different markets. Um, and we you know, help them with everything from business intelligence, CRM, tech development, APIs, um, all the way to logistics and last mile. Um, and we built that on our end-to-end -end proprietary tech platform and we're managing omni-channel um, across really kind of um, um, these markets. Um, in, in our e-commerce platform, which are sold as SaaS, is Brand IQ and e-commerce IQ. Um, you know, our presence are across Southeast Asia, five different markets, Thailand, Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Uh, we're backed by some, uh, you know, the private equity investors from KKR, um, you know, strategic investors, with DKSH, and also VCs. And the brands we work with, we have over 150 uh, brands that we enable across uh, the market um, and, and, and provide them full end-to-end -end services. Thank you, uh, Mr. Paul. That's that's a, a great overview of the landscape in Thailand. Um, I myself is in that industry as well, and it's getting super interesting there. Uh, let's then move on to Kun David. Uh, Kun David Jukat, uh, could you please uh, give us a quick one minute pitch on uh, your business team? Could you please bring up Kun David's slides? Thank you. And David, could you uh, unmute yourself? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, you're back. All right. Sorry about that. That's so, fine. <laughs> okay, we got to have one of these, right, uh, for any meeting. So, um, uh, Pomelo is an online brand and platform. We're based in Bangkok, started in 2013. And what we do is we, we have a, uh, we have created a fashion super app that connects uh, not just our own private label brand, but over 275 other brands to millions of customers across Southeast Asia. We're headquartered in Bangkok, but we operate in Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines. And, uh, you know, we're really targeting this growth in e-commerce, and in particular, the Gen Z and millennial segments. Uh, fashion lifestyle is uh, across Southeast Asia, a $63 billion uh, uh, market uh, with very high margins and, um, uh, and, and we're very excited to to play in that space. So that's a little bit about Pomelo. Thank you. Um, I, I think I'm a big fan of Pomelo fashion and, and it, it's such a traditional industry and how you came in uh, from a different angle. That's really refreshing. Um, let's move on to our fourth speaker, Captain Saran. Uh, if you could please uh, give us a quick overview of your business, that would be great. Kap. Sure, can I have the slide? Okay. So you guys may be wondering what Yggdrasil means. Yggdrasil is a tree in the Norse mythology. It's a tree that actually creates the whole world and the universe. Um, our background, we started 15 years ago from two passionate founders as a small production house. And eventually we grow into a more and more um, 
bigger provider of both visual, visual effect, animation, and game business. It's recently our company is over 200 strong. And for the past couple of years, we start venturing into a more futuristic realm. By starting our own, our own IP creation, we focus on virtual production, virtual influencers, mass online gaming, and at the very end, we aim to be on the map of our global digital entertainment industry in the world. Thank you so much, Kinsaran. Um, let's dive right in. And if the audience, if, if you're listening to this, um, if you have any questions, feel free to send them in. Um, if we have time, we might have time, um, send them in and we'll have a quick Q&A at the end. Okay. Uh, let's start with the first question, right? It's about strategy and sort of lessons uh, that you all uh, have, have uh, accumulated over the years. Uh, so the question is this, how do you grow an innovative business successfully in Thailand? And if you, if you have any thoughts on sort of unexpected lessons you learned along the way, what would that be? Um, who should we start with? Uh, let me let, let, let's change things up a bit. Uh, let's start with Paul. Um, Kun Paul, what's your, you know, what's your strategy? How do you grow it successfully in Thailand? Well, you know, the problem we were solving was incredibly complex, right? And so, you know, we we're solving everything from marketing, retail, all the way down to logistics and what we call kind of the e-commerce workflow management, right, for, for brands and end-to-end. -end. And so solving that problem, you know, was incredibly complex because we were dealing, especially in the logistics part, when you're dealing with logistics in Indonesia and in Philippines, you know, Thailand. So right from the get-go, you know, it's really important to have that kind of playing that long game and the vision and the foresight to see that, you know, there are going to be a, a lot of complexities at the local level, right? And so, you know, from the, from the get-go, you know, you have to think about really build, building a product that can scale, right? Whether whichever country that you you know you're in, and so I think that was probably for us, you know, one of the most challenging things was to really be able to execute, you know, the, the strategy, but the technology at a local level, and so building that product, right, and having to recruit a strong management team that can lead the company, lead you or us, myself, in that domain expertise, whether that's our chief product officer, or, you know, our COO or, or, or our CTO, um, and that was really important in being able to, you know, build a business that's able to scale. Um, and, and, you know, and, and frankly, it was, you know, we were early uh, when we started in 2013, we took that kind of leap of faith, you know, thinking that, you know, the, the industry would evolve this way. Right, and so you know, for us, we we have over you know 500 APIs in our proprietary tech platform, knowing that we basically had to integrate multiple different um, other platforms as well as our client systems. And so, really, kind of having that you know initial foresight in 2013, I think was you know um, very was challenging, but you know I think we were able to you know execute it and ex accelerate that um, you know uh, post COVID. Thank you, Kap. What about um, what about you, Kun David? Um, I mentioned a little bit about uh, the clothing in the fashion industry. What was sort of your strategy coming into this, and and how do you how do you crack it? Yeah, yeah I think um, the even when I was at Lazada uh, and and um, looking at the trends, you could see that um, Southeast Asia and and in particular Thailand had all of the necessary ingredients for digital disruption. And I think uh, whether it was broadband penetration, social media penetration, just the level of interest in all things digital, you could see that it was accelerating very quickly. And I think the key is in that situation, you know, every sector is going to go through some sort of digital transformation, right? And uh, for us, we chose to go into the fashion and lifestyle space. And once you go in, I think it's probably the experience of every entrepreneur, you start seeing different opportunities to bring new ideas and technology to drive uh, faster growth, uh, more efficiency, uh, you know, better customer experience. And I think, I think that's really the key. Always look for opportunities to innovate. And, um, and second, it comes down to, to people. You know, I think um, uh, technology entrepreneurship is actually very much uh, an apprenticeship system. So you kind of go through it, you learn from uh, other entrepreneurs, you learn from you know, other product builders, uh, you get that experience. And I think that's the culture right now that is being built in the Thai ecosystem. And I think uh, as, as it gets better and better, 
right? There's more and more knowledge that accumulates in, in the ecosystem. And I think that's the key. So you're going to naturally see, you know, better entrepreneurs, better companies coming out. Uh, I, I think we're just at the at the beginning point of that. I agree. And um, we, we can dive deeper in terms of uh, people and, and the, the, the core team uh, in, in the next question. Uh, let's go to Kun Saran, uh, shall we? Uh, Kun Saran, uh, your strategy or any lessons you, <laughs> you've learned along the way? Kap? Uh, well, yeah, that's a lesson we actually pay with a hefty price, actually. But um, I think the composition of creating an innovation, or just create a successful business, it comes down to first, you have a strong vision and mission, right? That's the fundamental of, of everything else. But there was strategy, execution of people. And then the next thing, after the vision and mission is strong enough, you can communicate, communicate it clearly among the co-founders and the top management. Then it boils down to a strategy. And then the execution of strategy, so you have a strategy, you've got to choose where you want to play this game and how you want to win this game. Clearly, how do you want to win this game? And then it comes out to execution of how you can execute this, the strategy that you mentioned in order to win this game, including the, the management system and reporting system, communication system within, also included IT system. Now, the thing that we miss is the people, like David mentioned. So I think we may come from a different standpoint or a different situation here. Um, as I've mentioned, we started a business 15 years ago, but then we want to shift our business. That was like three or four years ago. And back then for the past 10, 15 years back then, we were the service provider. So our culture is a culture of perfection. Right? You got you to deliver like perfect work for your clients. But now when you want to create something, the culture of the people has changed. You got to take more risky action. Right? So we cannot um, rely on being perfect anymore. Like we have to trade off the perfection for speed for many things else. Now, when this culture changed, we actually had to talk to a lot of people inside, you know, like the old ways not going to work anymore. And there were conflicts. And at the very end, you know, there has to be some shakedown. And we actually lost a um, certain amount of people that we believe were valuable, but the culture is not there. And then that's a capital, but that's not a big issue. The capital is quite prevalent in Thailand. But so from our lesson, we learned that Switching from a traditional business, conventional business into a more innovative, high growth business, usually it's the people, the incentive, and the management system that is the hindrance doing so. Thank you so much, Kap. Um, now let's go to Mr. Dan. Uh, Dan, Kap. Uh, so I've, I've looked at your company for a while and uh, I found it to be really inspiring, um, doing plant-based food, doing sustainability food. Food industry in Thailand is huge and uh, it's, it's also Quite competitive. Um, how do you how do you find your way to grow it uh, in, in in your own in your own way and sort of doing new things and and getting the market ready for your products? Kat? Right. So, um, you know, our original business is is really ethnic foods, which is as unsexy and uninnovative as it gets, <laughs> um, making sauce and ready to eat meals, and you know what 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 we did was we looked at first of all what is our what is it that we're trying to be is our purpose right and th there's a very clear challenge and a very clear opportunity and what we saw there is a very large total addressable market which is kind of like what who's going to feed the world and what are they going to eat that's going to prevent the world the food system from collapsing in the next 30 to 40 years um and there's only one really large um, decision and that is you've got to eat better food that's better for people and better for planet and when we looked at that and we 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 tried to say okay what is that white space where you know to Saran's point you know where are we going to win right and we saw very clear white space and that white space was we want to be the leading co-manufacturer for alternative proteins from ingredients all the way to products right and we saw that this white space was wide, wide open because I spoke to funds around the world corporates around the world, that there is no manufacturing capability that supports this from a pure plant-based certification perspective. And, you know, one of the reasons we saw is like, you know, most startups, they want to hang out in Silicon Valley. They want to be in snazzy offices, right? Nobody wants to be, you know, like an hour to the city in a factory. However, that's our core business, right? You know, we are, we are driven by co-manufacturing. You know, that's basically the basis of our, of where we are uh, from the competitive advantage perspective and an organization perspective. And so with that, um, with capital, um, we basically bought our way into technology. And what we're doing now is we're using Thailand as a home base because um, what we do have is brand Thailand, to your point. 
Um, and you know, we've got uh, you know, there's there's more than twenty thousand companies within the ecosystem of food, more than a million people within the food manufacturing and processing industry that we can tap. And I believe oftentimes innovation is, is largely overrated. Most of it's accidental, right? In terms of um, when you come up with ideas. And so you put a lot of smart, passionate people against a problem, right? I'm pretty sure that we're gonna come up with something great. And so, and with that, we have a very clear strategy in terms of how we wanna grow our footprint around the world and how we're solving pain points within the industry. You know, the, I would say the last challenge is as a listed company, how do we communicate, um, you know, the, 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 the profile between growth and earnings driven um, company, right? And so if it's the US, you know, we'd be, we'd be, we'd be valued based on our multiple of revenue, right? Versus here where we're, we're, we're driven on a multiple of earnings. And which is why we, you know, we're glad that we, we chose this particular path against our purpose um, three or four years ago, because the validation is happening now with climate change. And we are becoming now even relevant for fund managers because if you think about it, if you have if you own a portfolio, at some point you're going to have to decarbonize your portfolio, and you know potentially we could be that stock of choice. Thank you, Captain Dan. You're right on climate change is a huge thing, and it's uh, it's 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 surprising that we haven't come we haven't improved at all um, in the next in the past ten years. Now um, let's move on to the second question, right? Uh, we talked a lot about founders, core team, culture. Um, a lot of people think that you know innovative business it, it comes a lot from the vision, mission, and the, the core team that starts it. But I want to I want to also talk about the role of ecosystem in Thailand specifically. Um, how how has your journey been so far um, in in terms of you know what are your stories about how the the communities, the network, the funding communities, the public policies. Um, that are supportive of your uh, activities that we just discussed. Okay? Uh, and also, are there rooms for improvements uh, in this area? And if so, what they, what are they? Let's start with David. Um, could David, do you mind sharing your thoughts about ecosystem? Yeah, yeah maybe um, just one stat to start with is every year, Google, Tamasek, Bain, they issue a study about e-commerce um, and digital trends in Southeast Asia. And I think uh, three years ago they projected, uh, sorry, uh, the, the number that they projected we would get to three years from now, we've already hit it last year, right? And a lot of that has to do with the, the, the COVID-19 uh, situation and things moving online. But, uh, you know, digitization is accelerating right now. And uh, I think whether it's corporates, big corporates with deep pockets, startups, uh, there's, a, there's a renewed kind of interest and energy and I think that's great and you know we we have um, uh, investors you know central group is one of our big investors uh, we also have you know uh, venture capital private equity funds and um, I think I think the funding side is okay I think on the talent side uh, you know when we talk to a lot of the, the the big funds in Silicon Valley they're talking about machine learning AI big data right and 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 and, and the thing is you know it's not it's kind of moving past, is it just e-com or is it a platform business, right? They want to install new layers of intelligence to uh, even, even drive further growth and disruption. And, and I think that's an area that we all need to uh, look at and invest in together. I do think that uh, in terms of uh, that area, I think, I think we, we, we need to keep investing in, uh, in, in, in that sector in particular. Uh, but, but I think when it comes to developers, tech talent, there's been a, a lot of growth already. And I think uh, the funding, as mentioned before, um, is, is, not, is not really a primary uh, constraint at this point. Thank you, David, I agree with you. Um, I'm, I'm also in the, the data science community and the, the, the deaf community, and there, there are quite a lot of talent, but, but we, we need to, to continue to invest more and more into that area. Now let's move on to Kun Paul. Um, Kun Paul, what are your thoughts on ecosystems? Yeah, I mean, we were next business, so uh, <laughs> there might be a lot of uh, things to talk about there. Yeah, no, I mean, we um, we started in Thailand, and you know, just Thailand in terms of you know the uh, the middle class, the consumer uh, trends here. You know, actually, we we're very fortunate. There was much bigger basket size 
um, the other sophisticated, pretty advanced uh, logistics infrastructure. So kind of, you know, starting our business model in Thailand in 2013, you know, we were able to really scale as the marketplaces started to accelerate. Now, when you look at, you know, Lazada, Shopee, uh, you know, now JD, uh, you know, uh, and as well as Magento, you know, direct to consumer brand platforms, um, you know, uh, social as well as Line and Facebook, as these platforms started to ex really accelerate, a lot of the brands were trying to figure out, you know, how do they really kind of engage with their new consumer in this digital space and how do they transact? And so we were very fortunate to actually have these platforms, you know, already kind of at scale. And, you know, and that's what we did was be able to leverage those platforms to really build, you know, whether it was native marketing, e-commerce experiences for the brands across multiple different channels. Um, and, and, you know, that, and that Thai consumer really was leading that charge for us as we expanded to Indonesia. You know, there, you know, yes, you have a lot, lot larger market size, but the basket size um, is much smaller, right? And so the unit economics there are much more different. Um, you know, where Thailand, Singapore, I see Malaysia are a little more advanced, but if Ross, Philippines and Indonesia, you know, you have to invest quite a lot, right? And so, you know, the... But even though there were platforms out there as well, you know, the unit economics didn't really make sense as as, as Thailand as it did in Thailand. And so, you know, we were again very fortunate to actually have started in Thailand um, to have, you know, really kind of show that growth early on with, you know, when we raised VCs, um, you know, we eventually raised private equity. We raised about 100 million US in total. Um, and, and, you know, getting a, a, a partner like DKSH kind of similar to what David, you know, said was uh, strategic where we've learned a lot about, you know, working with blue chip brands as DKSH is the largest distributor in, in, in Southeast Asia and Asia. Uh, we learned a lot by, you know, from working with the blue chip brands, from accelerating, you know, helping them accelerate those brands in e-commerce and we, we learned from that and applied that learnings from b2c b2b um, across all the other uh, um, um, regions and so you know we were lucky to be able to have that kind of ecosystem and support structure um, you know early on thank you that, that that's interesting now let's go to kundan um kundan have any thoughts on um, ecosystem it could be you know an ecosystem of, of players supporting each other, like Kun, Kun, Kun Paul was mentioning, or it could be from the government standpoint as well. Yeah. Sure. So I, I think it really um, drills down to um, you know your business model and your and and what markets are you addressing. And so for us, uh, from an ecosystem perspective, because we're addressing a, a a global market in terms of building manufacturing capacity in in about five regions around the world, um, our ecosystem is quite wide now. We view Thailand as one of the potential production bases for alternative proteins um, from functional to plants and all the way to production um, midstream. Um, and within that ecosystem, I think uh, Thailand is quite, um, I would say, resource rich. So if we look at high level kind of policy making, I think it's there. Um, we've engaged with universities, um, for example, Konkan University, we're launching the first plant based um, master's degree. We're helping them to, to do that setting up a research institute, um, you know, so the government policy academia wise is very strong. I think from a, a policy promotion perspective, they're very eager to transition into new um, new S curves, new, new sources of development for the agriculture sector, which is 14 million strong farmers, right? Um, and then from a food processing perspective, you know, we're, we're world renowned. So there's enough companies within the ecosystem um, that are there to support, you know, companies such as us. So I think, Specifically from a food perspective, um, I, I think Thailand has a great ecosystem um, and, uh, you know, we can be one of those pot um, potential production bases that will drive the world. Thank you, Kundan. Uh, let, let's piggyback on, on this um, supporting initiatives by the government or public policies or the, the, the improvements. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on, on this, Kun Saran? Um, from your point of view, are there anything that, that you you know, good and bad, right? Um, like, like, what are some some improvements that could could be had? Yeah. Um, well, okay, I think there the are good things people a lot a lot of people mentioned already. But on the government perspective, um, how should I frame this? I mean, some more should be done. Some should be reconsidered and improved, and many more should be undone. So, for example, um, let's just compare um, Thailand to country around us. Let's just call it Singapore. I think Singapore may be the prime example here for the region. I think one thing that Singapore did to push and 
um, elevate their ecosystem for the birth of startup. For example, it's a matching fund, yeah, where um, VC invest money and the government co-invest with them to make the money more productive for the equity exchange by a startup. Now we need something like that in order to push the startup to grow faster. Now imagine when you start a startup, just like um, Paul and David said, like talent is quite lacking here. Just imagine now everyone's fighting for talents, including the big companies also, especially the tech, everybody feel it in the tech. The, you know, the salary increases on a rapid rate. Now just imagine when you want to do, let's say a software startup, software based startup, you can compete for those techs. Yeah. And usually it's quite hard to compete without having to pay um, nearly the same amount. Yeah. And usually with a small amount of funding, you cannot even compete. So I think that's one thing that the government program can actually come in and help with the VC to push the seed startup, which is the bedrock of the future innovations. Like the, the bigger companies are doing fine now, but if we take a look at the smaller sectors in the very fundamental of the funnels, the bedrock, the seed stage, the pre-seed stage, now we are lacking these. They're not growing as fast and they're not getting as much funding as they should. Now, eventually, right now, we see a lot of big companies. We see Paul, we see David, we see PDN, we see a lot of people. But just imagine in the next five, six years, what's going to happen? There's someone who plant the seeds into the farm of the startup to grow. So I think that's one thing the government can do. And many things that they can do um, in the bigger picture is to rethink about the regulation employ or deploy onto you know, um, different sectors. For example, um, I don't really think we need to apply for license to do certain business, for example, right? Why well, don't you just control the risk, make it a sandbox. If you're not bigger than this, just do it. And then when you come to this point, then you have to apply for the, for the license. Because just, um, let's say when you want to start a business, right? And you have to apply for a bunch of license, you got to pay for lawyers. It just, just people just go away. They just won't do it. But now just imagine people who don't really care. They're willing to break the law. They will do it anyway, because they know it's quite hard to get caught. So now you, I think that's where the government should reconsider and she can't even be undone on the certain regulations, such as FinTech, health tech related, um, certain e-commerce, not so much. I think, I think the e-commerce is doing fine, but um, certain things that involve the health and the healthcare people like FinTech and health tech is heavily regulated. I think those should be deregulated as fast as possible. Thank you, Captain Saran. Uh all, all good points, um, both the regulations and um, more support. I, I'd say maybe more support and also probably the right way of supporting pre-seed stage startups uh, and innovative uh, entrepreneurs. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people my age, around like uh, 30, early 30s, having a lot of uh, new interesting ideas and I, I'm, I'm uh, sort of, I'm hopeful to see, see them grow uh, in the next five to 10 years. Have, now let's move on to our final question, um, which is the, the, the question about capital markets. Um, I, I'd like to ask all of you, um, there are many questions to ask about capital markets, but I think one question that, that we, we, we think it would be fruitful to, to share today would be your thought process when you were deciding to list, right? And then sort of afterwards, what, how have you been using it, using the access to capital markets to expand or to help fulfill your mission? Let's start with um, Kundan maybe. Um, Kundan Kap, what are your thought process? Uh, what, what was it like when you were deciding to list? And how are, are you using it to your, um, to your mission, Kap? Uh, you're, you're muted now. Thank you. Sure, thank you for the question. So um, for, for us, because um, you know, we, we knew from the very beginning that we had a somewhat of a more complex story to tell and uh, something that was probably more of a, um, an issue in, in more OECD, um, more developed markets um, where you know, uh, investors would appreciate. We, we actually um, were reviewing different exchanges from uh, Hong Kong to Singapore um, and then obviously for, um, to NASDAQ, LSE. And eventually we decided um, together with our um, advisors at SCB, they were, they were great in helping us, guiding, guiding us through this, um, that we could convince investors um, about our story, our growth profile, and get them to understand. I think we did a pretty good job in terms of that. And uh, 
I, I think that the, the Thai stock exchange is one of the best exchanges, um, to be honest, um, especially obviously for, for, for Thai companies, um, because I think it was very respect, receptive to um, our model, um, not just from the exchange perspective, which was very helpful, but from institutionals as well as as well as retail. Um, you know, our market cap is almost um, 15 billion. It was it was at one point. And so and, and you know, we just were incorporated to set 100. Um, now, in terms of how it's benefited us um, as a public company, that has been somewhat surprising um, and in a very positive way. And so I, I think if you kind of looked at plant based um, before IPO and you looked at plant based after IPO, there's been a flurry of activities. Um, uh, and, you know, obviously uh, from media, press, as well as uh, most food companies now have, uh, have announced some kind of plant based strategy. And I'm very happy because that grows the space, right? Um, especially here in Thailand. And so I think number one is obviously you have access to capital. I mean, there's so much liquidity here. Um, number two, if you explain the story well, um, I think there's a very large receptive um, um, in investor base. Um, uh, you know, and then num number three is, uh, you know, access to funding. We just got um, a credit guarantee that that gets us like AAA um, um, uh, credit rating to issue bonds. Uh, from one of the credit guarantee agencies because of our sustainability strategy. And that's one of the most impressive things I've found about the stock exchange is uh, if you have a sustainability angle, I mean, there's there's different tools and uh, mechanisms mechanisms you can use where you can enrich basically your, your, your capital structure um, and lower your overall cost of funding and, abil uh, and that ability for what you want to do. Um, and then th that last part was really kind of access to institutions that we had never known before. Um, you know, and just the ability to get our word out is just as, as a public company specifically here in Thailand. Um, that's just such a great platform that I never thought of. Oh, that, that sounds great. And, and congrats again on the set 100. Like, uh, um, let, let's uh, move to Kun David. Uh, David, do you have anything to share um, your thought process? Yeah, um, we're, we are uh, obviously not yes, yet a listed company, so I, I don't have many of the specifics to share, but I think um, more broadly, you know, um, in, 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 in tech, I think, and in growth stage businesses, uh, capital remains very important, right? I think we talked about the need to compete for talent, to uh, build infrastructure, um, to build your brand and to continuously stay on the forefront. So I think, I think that's, um, that's critical. And, you know, if you kind of look at the, the tech and digital landscape, um, you know, you, you see that many of the big verticals and the big platforms are um, controlled by uh, uh, non-Thai non companies, right? And, and, and I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I've been in Thailand for about 10 years now, but, uh, you know, Pomelo is very much a Thai company and we're headquartered in Bangkok, 90% of our staff is 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 Thai, and I think that you know it, it, within that context, it also makes sense to uh, explore uh, a local listing. And like uh, uh, many people have mentioned, I think you know that CT has uh, very good liquidity, very very wide range of investor set. And I think most importantly, I think the uh, exchange is looking very seriously at how to drive growth in 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 the digital sector specifically. Uh, which is why you know Paul and myself are, for example, on this, uh, uh, you know, uh, presenting right now on this panel. So um, yeah, well, I mean, we're we're really excited. I think you know to win, you have to invest, and as long as you know you're investing in an area where uh, you know the future is heading, I, I think you're 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 uh, you know you need to stay uh, aggressive in terms of um, uh, trying to get that price. So that you know more broad broad comments, but. Um, uh, around access to capital, yeah, for me. Thank you for your comment, Kap and David. Um, and Saran, what, what, what about you? What do you think about the you know, decision to, to, to access to the capital markets in Thailand? Okay, so back then we were, we had two choices, whether to stay private and just raise to private market or to go public and raise to um, capital market on the, on the SET. Now, we, like, we know capital is a magnifier of what I've mentioned before, the execution, the strategy, the people, so on, so on. But I mean, the main reason we decided to list on the exchange is because we know at the one day, uh, we have to compensate for our talents. Yeah, And the easiest way to attract talents and to get them to 
innovate more is to ensure that the mass flow of the mass flow IRFU of need is fulfilled, especially in the uh, very bottom of the mass flow, mass flow uh, IRFU of need, which means the wealth and the security of the people. They can support their family, right? And once our top, um, the top management and the mid management are sure that you know they have nothing to worry about for for their family, then creativity can come, innovation can come. They don't have to worry like what are we going to eat for dinner? What are we going to eat tomorrow? Yeah, and going to, going public uh, has one benefit on that because now the ESOP that they have actually have value and can be liquid and just be easy. They can show their wife they have real money whether they liquid it or not. Yeah, so there's no there's no pressure from home. That's one thing. It also surprised me. Um, maybe different lesson from Kundan. Um, we had a nice partner coming to join us like after we got listed too. So last year, um, BDS group also joined part of our cap table as one of our strategic partner. And they've been advising us a lot in terms of um, the growth and the business plan and then how to manage human resources, so and so. Now, another thing about capital market that help accelerate the growth is, you know, innovation is risky. Yeah, innovation is risky. And when we talk about type of risk, we talk about the risk of ruin. You know, lose the whole thing. Now, in order to make impact, it's a function of how much capital you have. And with more capital, generally you can have more impact throughout your innovation. So back then when we were, when we were stay private, um, we can experiment with certain things, but the budget we can allocate for those experiments may not be as impactful, even when successful. Now, after we got listed and we have more, uh, more budget, we can manage the risk better. The impact from our project got a lot higher. For example, like back then, we would never experiment with um, virtual influencers. Because if this thing goes go south, it's not going to be good for the company. But now we know, worst come to worst, this thing goes south, we're still fine. We have enough capital, way more, way enough. Yeah, so in short, um, the benefit of capital for, from us, from outside, apart from people, is we can experiment with many more things within the same period of time with high impact. Or we can experiment with the same amount of things within a shorter period of time, again, with high impact. Thank you, Kunsaran. Um, all good points. And, and I never thought of the, the liquidity of ESOP as being one of the main, um, you know, benefits uh, that, that, you know, especially during this time, right, uh, during COVID, right, like the stability uh, and taking care of your, your, your members and your, your, your company is, is it really important. Now, um, uh, let's uh, go to Kun Pao. Um, Kun Pao, what are your thoughts? And then I think we should have just a bit of time left for one question. You have. Sure. Um, you know, we're not a public company uh, yet. And, you know, for us, uh, why we're looking at, you know, really kind of capital markets. Um, you know, when you look at just e-commerce and e-commerce today, it's a generational opportunity and it will be over the next 10 years. And we're just really touching on that. Right. And when you look at just that opportunity over the next 10 years, you know, a lot of that traditional retail B2B is even going to start to shift towards online. And so, you know, we have a big uh, um, opportunity ahead of us. I um, mean, also, when you look at the marketplaces that where a lot of people think, you know, um, the, mar the marketplace model, it's a very capital intensive model. Right. And, you know, some of these guys are not going to be profitable for probably, you know, 15, 20 years. Right. But when you look at our model where we're in e-commerce enablement or SaaS, right, it's a much more profitable and, and you know, really kind of conservative uh, investor friendly. Right. And our vision for us is to be, you know, the Bloomberg terminal and operating panel for for e-commerce in Southeast Asia. And, you know, when you look at really e-commerce and how complex it is, right, to be able to centralize, you know, all the data and analytics on the one platform and to be able to control your business from marketing all the way down to logistics and, 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 and et cetera. It's a very bold vision for us. And so, you know, for us, we, you know, we, we went through kind of your typical fundraising of going through VC, uh, private equity. And now, we, you know, through these stages, even you know, after private equity, you know, very much uh, very protocols driven and optimize their business to profitability. And this is where we you know for us now uh, being able to tap into the public markets to really you know, accelerate our, our SaaS vision and expand into markets in Vietnam and the rest of Southeast Asia. Um, is something that we're really excited about. Um, and again, you know, the opportunity is huge and, you know, getting access to the capital markets kind of very similar to Shopee, um, you know, and what they did in, with NASDAQ. Um, you know, we feel that, you know, that, that opportunity is, you know, bit, uh, not say as big, but pretty big in Thailand. And we're excited to be a Thai company to be able to expand across Southeast Asia and really kind of win the market in this sector. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so one question. Um, 
Do you think, and this is from an audience, by the way, um, and if anyone wants to answer it, um, feel free. Do you think diversity in hiring is an important ingredient for innovation? So I think we have maybe like just uh, anyone want to answer this? I can, I can shoot because it's very relevant to us. And Go so ahead. Um, because of our sustainability focus um, and our focus around um, the UN uh, United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, um, diversity is extremely important um, for us, especially for our customers, um, because that's, this is what they want, right? Not only do they want climate friendly company, they want companies that are aligned with, uh, um, with, with their values. And because we deal with multinationals around the world, they also want to see gender inclusive um, um, policies. And so even our, from our board, all the way to our organization, um, we feel that that's super important for alignment with our customers. Um, I think the second um, is around kind of just um, overall um, innovation um, thought process um, working internally. Um, we, we see it, it's very clear that having a very diverse um, uh, um, employee base as well. Um, in fact, we actually skew more towards um, um, females and males actually in our company. Um, we feel that it's ex extremely valuable. Um, I would say it's almost an asset being able to be, um, be diverse. Thank you. And I, and I definitely agree with that. Um, you know, for us, you know, our most recent independent directors were two. They were, you know, female directors, co-founders, female, and we feel that you know, basically, just having a diverse viewpoint in the business really enables you, you know, to, to actually be much more innovative and and more open-minded, right? To be able to look at you know, things that, you know, I would say that is incredibly valuable as a company is to innovate and expand, right? You see that having different viewpoints um, and, 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 um, and insights is really incredibly important across the business. All right. Thank you, Kun Paul and, and everyone. Um, I, unfortunately, we are out of time, um, but I hope uh, this session has been inspiring and also, um, um, you know, for, for a representation of uh, better futures of, of, of Thailand innovative business uh, that's coming soon, right? Uh, so let's hope uh, that uh, we all could uh, see many, many more companies uh, like like the ones that we discussed today in the cup. And thank you so much, uh, the speakers and the audience. Sorry,